Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on the Transparency and Consent Framework um, developed by IB Europe uh, in cooperation with our members. My name is Chris Hartsucker, and um, I'll be your host for today. And I'm joined by my colleague Matthias Matizen from IB Europe, as well as Julien Delamo from AppNexus. And they're going to take you through the framework, give you a policy overview and a technical overview. And after that, there will be uh, about 15 minutes for questions and answers at the end. Um, please note that there's a questions uh, pane where you can submit your questions. I'll read those out at the end of the webinar. Uh, and as a final, uh, just overall housekeeping remark, we are recording this. The recording will be sent to all of you who attended. And we will also send you a copy uh, of the slides. So without any further ado, I would ask Matthias to um, get started. Thank you, Chris. Hi, everyone. So we're, we're giving a presentation, as you know, about the transparency and uh, consent framework that uh, IAB Europe members of the GDPR implementation group have been working on for a little more than a year now. We started um, this, this GDPR implementation group to look at the GDPR and what it meant for our industry. And when we looked at some of the issues we realized after several months of talking amongst, amongst privacy professionals and legal uh, folk that even though the GDPR is primarily a legal challenge, we need a technology response to meet some of the transparency and control requirements that arise as a result of it. So we're going to briefly talk about the EU regulatory challenges that have led us here, as well as solutions that present themselves in closed ecosystems and how we propose that the open, that this open framework um, can, can continue uh, allowing the independent sort of flexible open ecosystem to continue doing business. And then Julien is going to take you through the standard framework, its goals, what the technical components are, and, um, uh, and, and, and how you can implement and sort of next steps. And then we are also happy to take questions. So this slide is meant to show that we are a complex ecosystem with many different players um, in it on, on both the sell side and the, uh, the, the buy side. And there is various different data flows and um, together we must figure out a way to work um, together in order to make sure we can provide the right disclosures. We can um, offer data subjects, so that's the user, the correct um, control, be it through a right to object, be it through consent, um, uh, and, and another data subject rights. Um, and you know, here, here you'll, you'll see it from the other side around it. it, it it's really important because of all of these various actors that we work very closely together and in order to work together, we do need the standard that we are going to present today. First, first things first, um, the GDPR is not just about consent. That is a frequent misconception, but there is actually six co-equal so-called legal grounds for processing personal data. Uh, they range from consent to legitimate interest contract, um, uh, compliance with a legal obligation, vital interests, and so on. So if there is a lot of flexibility within the GDPR to justify personal data processing um, it, with, with one of six legal bases that is the most appropriate for a given case. So it means that consent under the GDPR is not always needed. However, for the purposes of accessing and storing information on devices, such as cookies, the e-privacy directive, not to be confused with the proposed e-privacy regulation, uh, currently mandates obtaining consent uh, for accessing and storing that information. However, that doesn't mean that once that requirement is met, you still need to rely on consent in order to process personal data that may have been collected as a result of that access. This framework is designed to facilitate in a very flexible way the different needs of publishers and vendors in different situations that centers around 
transparency, control, and choice, no matter how uh, that control and choice is actually facilitated. Um, we have several challenges, and regulatory are just one of them. We have this issue of um, data leakage. You know, how can a publisher really control uh, where the data of their user is uh, users is going and how it is going to be processed? And that is often um, also due to the fact that there is uh, not enough transparency uh, by both publishers and consumers ultimately over the partners and demand sources that are showing up on page and their partners and their partners' partners and so on and so forth. We also do not have a single privacy policy. All of these various partners do process data very um, differently. They have different policies, they have different requirements, and it is not always easy to uh, present that to a user in an easily accessible way or indeed for a publisher to have that information to even pass it on to their users. And we have the e-privacy directive and the e-privacy regulation, which provides challenges around obtaining and, and transmitting consent choices. We have GDPR requirements. How do we justify with a legitimate interest or consent or another legal basis the processing of any personal data collected um, under the rules of the e-privacy? And how can we meet all of these various challenges in a way that still enables ad-funded businesses to continue monetizing their services? There are benefits with respect to meeting some of these challenges with a uh, closed ecosystem, but I think we also recognize that with all of these advantages around controlling data leakage and having a single uh, privacy policy, for example, which may make it easier to obtain consent or provide control um, and therefore comply with the law, there's also challenges, particularly ar around the control of the data within these systems making sure that the appropriate degree of reporting happens, you know, what the, the control, the further down control of third party partners happens and, and controlling demand sources. So this open standard framework for the uh, ecosystem outside of sort of closed ecosystems is meant to address these challenges um, by providing transparency, very important, for consumers and publishers into the partners that help monetize sites um, and apps. In fact, the GDPR mentions online advertising only once by name, and it is in the context of transparency, citing the, the, the number of different players, um, which make it sometimes difficult for users to understand how their data is processed. And it's really an, an invitation to our industry to provide better transparency. Then we are trying to have control for publishers over partners that are operating on the sites and apps and processing their users' data in a standardized manner, which enables publishers to pass on control to consumers over how, how their personal data is collected, used, by whom, for what purposes. Again, control being a key component of the GDPR. This hopefully will enable us to do uh, to, to, to deal with consent as a potential legal basis, where it is either desired as a legal basis or required, but taking into account that there are situations that may al uh, allow um, uh, other legal basis as well. Um, and we want to enable the industry to do this through a more standardized way that allows publishers and partners to operate and communicate efficiently using one single open source standard. We need one language, um, one standard to communicate these very important things um, effectively. I think everybody will appreciate that given the various different players involved, it would be almost impossible to manage communications around transparency, control, consent, without some degree of um, standardization. And we believe that the way to go about standardization is through um, a, a, an inclusive process that is industry driven, that is not for profit, that doesn't put any one company's um, commercial interests first, but is truly an industry governed effort that anybody can have visibility into, can provide feedback in and scrutinize. And if 
and 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 take um uh, take away and implement in 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 the way that that works for them. So despite standardization, which we do believe is necessary, we want to make sure that there is also flexibility. Standardization shouldn't mean a one size fits all approach, and we want to particularly provide flexibility for publishers, but also for demand sources to build or work solutions that are um, that are in, that are compatible between different providers. And when we do this, if we do it right, we can minimize disruption to the internet, which ultimately will benefit consumers, publishers, the supporting companies, so basically everyone. I think it's important to mention that minimizing disruption is not the same thing as maintaining the status quo. It should be plain for everyone to see that what we are proposing here is a pretty big change to the status quo. But the, changing the status quo shouldn't mean making things bad for, for the industry. So we, we are hopeful that this framework will enable changing the status quo in a way that is positive. When we are looking at the transparency and consent framework, it is built on four different pillars. We have three pillars which require a degree of central governance. And those you can see in the orange bubbles. And then we have one pillar, the user interface that provides transparency into data processing and um, allows a user to exercise choice. That is decentralized and fully customizable. Um, so each publisher can implement this framework in a look and feel that makes sense for them. They can implement it in a way that meets their particular compliance needs or their interpretation of the law or their commercial interests. They can choose what the choices are that um, uh, a consumer has or doesn't have and what the consequences are of a user choosing one option over another if there is such an option. Um, it is also completely within the power of the publisher to choose who to work with. And the framework provides a global vendor list, which is a registry of technology vendors that um, make available information about themselves as the GDPR requires, such as the purposes for which they're processing data, the legal grounds for processing that they're relying on for that data, and where their privacy policy is found and um, um, other information that is required under the GDPR. And because we are centralizing that information in a single place for publishers to access, we can make sure that the transparency and user choice that the decentralized UI provides can still be um, dynamically updated, which means that rather than um, vendors needing to bilaterally communicate with all of their various publishers once information about them changes that needs to be disclosed. They can update that in the central place and publishers can get that information and use it for disclosures in a, in a way without requiring a lot of bilateral um, communication. Again, the global vendor list, think of it as a pool of available party uh, third party vendors to work with. It is not by any means the vendor list that everybody will have to work with full um, um, in full. So you can pick and choose who from the available parties a publisher wants to work with. We then have a reference architecture um, or the technical standards that define um, how to uh, obtain the information from the global vendor list and making it available um, at a technical level on the user interface. It defines the data format that encodes which, which technology vendors a publisher works with and for which purposes they are okay to process the personal data of a user. And it can also encode, if consent is captured, the choice of that user. Um, the reference architecture also includes instructions on how those, in, um, th those choices of the publisher and or the user are transmitted through the supply chain in both the situation where vendors are on page so that they can obtain that information or where the vendors are interacting with publisher inventory 
um, programmatically. We will, uh, there, there, there is a field available in the open RTP protocol that enables transmitting these standardized um, um, data uh, structures. And then lastly, with every language, there is grammar and what the reference architecture um, is with respect to language, the policy will be the grammar. We need common rules to um, make sure that the language is spoken in a way that we all understand, in a way to make sure that we can mitigate um, uh, potential conflicts um, of signals that may result, but also to foster trust. As we are embarking on a scenario where we are sending signals through the ecosystem, the recipients of the signal need to be sure that those signals mean what they're supposed to mean. We need to define what that meaning is in the, in the policies. Likewise, for publishers who are relying on information that is provided by, um, by third-party vendors on the global vendor list and potentially um, allowing them to process the data of their user or to uh, uh, capture a user's consent as pertains to that vendor, publishers want to be sure that these vendors are trustworthy. So we need to, um, we need to clarify what the rules are for membership in this global vendor list and um, uh, do some uh, diligence um, of making sure that those are indeed good actors and not bad apples. Before we move on to the technical aspects of this, um, I want to address some very common FAQs. Um, so the first question that we usually get, and I have already addressed it in, my, in, my, in the previous slide, is do publishers have to facilitate transparency and obtain consent for all vendors on the vendor list? And the answer is no. Publishers control which vendors they work with. They can pick and choose who they disclose, who they allow to process the personal data of their users, and who on whose behalf they obtain consent, or if they want to con obtain consent um, at all. Um, that, that is very important because we do not want to impose anything on anybody, really. This is very flexible. Does the framework only support global consent? Global consent is a consent that can be carried by a third party vendor from one publisher to the next. So if I go to publisher one and I consent there to third parties uh, data processing, do I have to consent again when I go to publisher two? If the consent is global, I don't have to. If the consent is what well, we say site specific, then I would have to consent on every service um, over and over again. There's pros and cons for both of these approaches. And again, the framework is fully flexible. It puts control or the choice of what type of consent um, should be obtained in the hands of the publisher. So they can choose to obtain service specific consent, or they could work together with a group of trusted publisher partners to share consent amongst that group of publishers, or they could integrate into a global um, um, transparency and consent mechanism that enables the uh, spread of the burden of <clears throat> providing transparency and choice to users across all participating publishers. Again, there's pros and choice, uh, pr pros and cons um, between those choices, and we leave them to the respective publisher. Does the framework support different purposes for different vendors? And in the current iteration, it does not. Why? Because we struggle with a payload that is too large. But we have received a lot of feedback from publishers, which we take extremely seriously. And we are currently revisiting that question because we do not disagree with, um, uh, we do not disagree that it would be good if we could provide better granularity and more control 
um, as long as we can find viable technical solutions to make that happen. We have very smart engineers working on these things. So we are um, hopeful, if not certain, that we can find a way that addresses that concern. So then the last question is who will maintain the pieces of this framework, which need to be centrally managed. So for example, the global vendor list, um, the policy, um, or uh, the reference architecture, the technical reference architecture. So IB Europe for the moment is um, driving the interpretation and the communication of this framework, and we will be managing the global vendor list. In fact, global vendor list registrations are expected to go live at the end of this month, as well as CMP registrations. The uh, IB Tech Lab, which has great experience in managing the technical specifications of, of other projects as well, is going to be responsible uh, for handling the feedback and iterating and providing updates and new versions of the framework um, to improve that. I think it is super important for everybody to understand that all of these different aspects are not a done deal. They will always have to be improved. They will always have to change to address both the feedback from the market that we receive so that we can continue meeting the requirements of market participants, but also to respond to the changing regulatory landscape. There is many things that are currently vague where uh, it is unclear what the rules are. And we need to go on the basis of a best effort um, uh, to, to, to interpret these rules. As there is more guidance or case law or regulatory practice, um, we will take a look again at the policies, for example, and update them to make sure that this framework remains viable also in future. So it is it is a framework that will be living and breathing and will be subject to improvements uh, over time. So we recognize this is not a done deal, it's not a perfect solution, um, but it will be a better solution over time because we will update it. And with that, um, I will hand it over to Julien. Thank you, Matthias. Um, so now that we've been giving uh, an overview of the GDPR, giving context and providing like uh, overview of the framework, I'm going to be focusing a bit more on the technical part of the framework. So I uh, will be focusing on three of the pillars from the framework, which are one, the industry vendor list, which again is uh, some kind of common language that will allow everybody uh, in the industry to refer to a vendor uh, by the same ID. I will also mention and talk about the customizable UI, consent UI, that is not part of the framework, but is supported by the framework through some uh, APIs and JavaScript libraries. And uh, finally, I will discuss uh, and I will present how the consent once it has been obtained can be stored and transmitted from one vendor to the other um, through, the, through the framework. So moving to next slide, um, we're going to see the industry vendor list. Um, Maria, if you can move, yeah, thank you. So, um, so the industry vendor list. So like we mentioned already, right, this industry vendor list uh, aims to be as um, complete as, as possible uh, to contain a list, uh, um, a point for every member, every vendor from uh, from the industry, but it doesn't mean to be um, every vendor that will need to be asked consent on behalf of from the publishers. Those are really just a pool from which user can pick and choose which one they want to. Um, th this list would be, as we mentioned, right, hosted by the IAB Tech Lab, but uh, and and will be available to everyone, and it will be requested through uh, a, a set of JavaScript APIs that would be available from the framework. Um, once the list has been re requested, uh, you, can be, you, you can use it in order to um, select which vendors you want to ask con uh, consent on behalf of and uh, send back the result to, to the vendors. Uh, moving to the next slide, we're going to see an example of what this list can look like. So on the right side of this slide, you can see two lists. On the top right side, you can see the vendor list uh, or a minimal example, minimal, a minimal version representation of that list. So minimum information in that list will include an ID, 
for every vendor, the company name for the vendor, a link to this vendor privacy policy, which can be used to provide more information to the user when asking consent on behalf of this vendor. And the last part of this list, we also, for each vendor, there will be a list of purposes that the vendor is applying for. So purposes um, are basically the uh, reason for why you're trying to process data. So example of what the purposes could be is analytics, for example, or just requesting consent to read and set cookie on the user, which is already something that is needed today as, as per e-privacy directives. Uh, so those are just examples of what purposes would be. The second list on the bottom right side would be the list of purposes um, that will, as well, such, such as the vendor list, will be also standardized and centralized by the IAB. Uh, so purpose list will contain the list of every purpose that are available under the framework. And same as for the vendor list, for each purpose, we will have a unique ID that allow us to refer to it the same way among vendors and among publishers and buyers. It will also contain the purpose name as well as a link to the purpose description. So user, if they want to, can inquire about uh, getting more information about what this purpose is and what their data is being used for. Um, so those are the global vendor list. And again, you, you can see this as kind of a common language. Um, the next step is so to be able to retrieve this list and to be able to then ask for consent store the consent and, and transmit the consent, the framework will provide JavaScript library and API to support this. So um, we also known as the CMP, the Consent Management Platform. Those APIs will basically allow um, you to retrieve the global vendor list as well as global purpose list in order to be able to build a consent UI on which we have complete control uh, for the look and feel of the UI and what's, uh, what's considered consent as per your own um, interpretation of the GDPR as a publisher. But those API will allow you to communicate in a standard way um, with the CMP um, to be able to store the consent and to be able to then transmit it to the different partners that you work with. Um, moving to the next slide. So using this API, you as a publisher will be able to um, provide your users with a consent UI. Again, I think it's very important here, and I want to emphasize on the fact that this UI is under full control of the publisher. This is not a UI that is defined by the framework, because we want every publisher, since they will be responsible to asking consent on, on behalf of the different vendors, to decide and control how this consent is being asked to, to, to their users. Uh, so. Again, just an example of what a UI leveraging the CMP UI from the framework will look like is this one. So you could imagine, and again, just an example here, that this uh, on first time user goes on a website, is being exposed with this um, pop-up that is basically giving him like overview of what we're going to ask him. So just ask him to use this cookie and to be able to process his data. From there, the user could have a choice to reject our cookie or accept all cookies, and also have the third choice of uh, to show purposes to basically go to advanced settings to have a bit more control, um, and then going to this show purposes advanced settings button, it will be exposed to this to a second page where you basically will have much more granular control over what is. Um, or what purpose are we asking him consent for, and for which vendors uh, are we asking him consent for. And for each of those, the user will have the ability to either give consent or withdraw consent uh, as per its choice, right? And then just save, and uh, that way we, we, get, we obtain the user's consent information. So uh, once the consent has been obtained from the user, it has to be stored. Uh, the framework doesn't define a specific uh, storing mechanism, but it does provide APIs and standards to be able to communicate and to be able to support the different mechanism. Uh, the reason, again, this part is not defined by the framework is because we want to leave 
publishers with enough flexibility to support any use case that they'd like to. Uh, what that means is the way this framework has been, has been designed with the API that we provide, as a publisher, you can decide to have either a consent that will be stored only locally for your own website, or you could decide to have a consent that, once obtained by the user, is then shared across multiple websites. And you can imagine having a consent shared uh, for a group of websites, so uh, an, an alliance of websites that decide to work together and decide to share consent among each other, or you could also decide to have your, the consent shared across globally, basically across every website that decides to share consent globally, uh, which obviously has the benefits of providing, a, let's say, smoother user experience, because since the content is being shared, the content doesn't, does not need to be requested on every new website, and it can, it can be reused from one website to another, so not having to expose the user again and again to the consent UI from one site to another, and also the ability from this to be able to share consent, so most likely to obtain a much broader consent for a much larger list of vendors. Um, so, on the consent has been obtained to the UI that we've been looking at, uh, example of UI that we've been looking at, on the consent has been stored locally or shared uh, with third party um, uh, publishers, the consent will then need to be transmitted from one vendor to another. So, for example, as a publisher, you work with a DMP or SSP and app server. Uh, what that means is those partners of yours, they will provide you with a way to pass them the consent information, or more likely, those partners will automatically, using the CMP API, retrieve the consent information that was obtained, and then they will send it, send it in the at, at call uh, to their platforms. Um, this consent will then be able to, to be read by this partner. So from this, you will be able to know if as an SSP or as an app server, as a DMP, he has consent for the different purposes he wants to be uh, able to process the data. And then whenever calling another partner server side, so an exchange or a DSP, um, a DMP server side, uh, an analytics platform, all of those uh, will be passed the consent information to the daisy chain. Uh, in order to represent the, uh, the consent information, it will be represented by a binary chain. So basically, every vendor will have a one or zero that will describe whether or not it got consent from the user for this impression. Um, and, and then this information will be passed to the OpenRTB standard. So uh, in order to be on track for May 25th, we will first uh, implement an extension of the OpenRTB before with OpenRTB 3.0, uh, including it directly into the standard of the OpenRTB. Uh, so uh, I imagine everything we've, we've been now discussing about every piece of the framework. I can imagine this not to be entirely clear yet. Uh, hopefully, this slide and the next one will provide you with a much clearer image of how the framework is working and how every step of the, of the framework uh, is working. So this is basically just putting an image on everything we've been discussing about, uh, showing you an end-to-end -end example of the framework in action. So uh, starting from the left side, so basically, uh, user when on your, on your website for the first time, you ask him consent to the UI that you've built or that the third party has been providing you uh, to request consent. User has, making, has been making some choice about which vendors he wants to allow to process his data, or which purposes for, for which purposes the allow uh, to be processing this data. And on the left side, you can see what the result of this consent given looks like. So basically, user gave consent for the five purposes that were exposed to him. So purpose one to purpose five with ID one to ID five. And then he also gave consent to some of the vendors he was asked for, and he did not give consent to some of the other vendors. Uh, so, also important to mention here that, as you can see, this vendor list includes only 41 vendors. What that means is that from the much larger global vendor list, which will contain a thousand, let's say, of vendors from the industry, the publisher in question in that example decided to 
limit this vendor list to only these 41 vendors, which are the vendors that he works with or that his main buyers works with and that he, he wants to request consent on behalf of. So on this vendor list, you can see, for example, SSP1 with the ID1 that obtained consent. And you can also see Exchange2 with ID4 that did not obtain consent. So again, on the left side, this is the uh, consent choice from the... Can we move back to the previous slide, please? This is the consent information obtained... Uh, no, yeah, um, this one, perfect, thank you. This is the consent information obtained by the user. Uh, the framework, thanks to the API, will then translate this information into this binary chain that you can see in the center of the slide, right? So basically, for every purpose, we will give a one or a zero depending on if the purpose obtained consent or not. So since the five purpose obtained consent, you can see that the purpose choice string contains five one. Then comes the vendor choice string. And as you see, uh, the SSP one with ID one will be in position one. And because you have 10 consent, we have a, a one. But exchange two with ID four, so position four, uh, will obtain a zero. And if you look at this string, you can see that this fourth bit in this string is a zero, which again indicates that action should did not obtain consent. Uh, once we have this string of one and zero, we will just basically compress, compress it uh, into uh, um, a base 64 value, uh, chain value. So in my example, this ends up as three F, D, F, et cetera, et cetera. So now that we have obtained this consent information, we've translated it in a small string of characters that can be transmitted from one member to another, to, from one vendor to another, that's what we will do. So, um, as, you, as you remember from the previous slide, we computed the consent payload as 3FDF, etc. So this payload will be happened to every partner from the publisher. So, for all the, mem all the partners that the publisher work with and are integrated client-side on his website through ad tag, so in, in this example, on this slide, you can see DMP1, SSP2, SSP1 are all direct partners from the publisher. So all of those will get in the ad call, the constant payload append to the, to the ad call, which means that SSP1, SSP2, and DMP1 upon ad call will be able to retrieve this constant information, will be able to read it, will be able to encode it following the reverse process from the previous slide, and from there, we'll be able to obtain the table of consent from the users that we've seen on the previous slide. Every SSP from there will be able to know if he has consent or not. So on this slide, you can see the partners, the vendors that obtained consent in green and the vendors that did not obtain consent in red. So every vendor will be able to, to know if he obtained consent or not. And from there, he will be able to know if he can use the data or not, or if he can use it, under which purpose he can do that. Uh, and as you can see, every SSP that will then reach out to Exchange, that will send bid requests to exchanges and to DSPs, in, as part of those bid requests, which most likely, again, are following OpenRTB protocol, um, we also have the consent payload happen to it, which means that Exchange 1 will as well receive the same consent payload, and from there, we'll also be able to know if you obtain consent or not. Uh, in the case of Exchange 2, for example, which did not obtain consent, when SSP2 called him, passing in the consent payload, Exchange 2 will be able, again, to read this consent payload, this 3FD consent string, and from there, uncut it and know that it did not obtain consent for this use user, and it will then know that he basically can't use the personal data that he might have on this user. Uh, because it was not obtained consent for, for, for that specific impression, specific user. And again, those partners will keep passing through the daisy chain, the consent information, allowing each vendor to know its consent status. Uh, another important point here, which also is a requirement from GDPR, is the audit trait. So basically being able to provide proof that when you process as a vendor, when you process or as a publisher, as a buyer, when you process the user's data, you did have consent. Uh, without this framework and in the current state of the industry, we absolutely don't know if we obtained consent, and we really just assume that we did. 
using this framework and because the consent information is being passed in every bid request, every vendor will have a proof that they obtain consent and at least or at least we're told that they obtain consent, which obviously can be used as the audit trail, as the log trace that is required by the GDPR. So um, we basically see uh, how the framework will allow publishers to obtain consent to store this consent information and then to transmit it from one vendor to another, allowing vendors to keep processing data when they obtain consent from the user, uh, protecting them legally uh, from the, under the GDPR, and allowing them to keep spending the way they do or keep using the data the way they do um, when obtaining consent uh, on, the, on the publisher's users. Uh, so to summarize what these uh, frameworks provide to the industry is much more control and transparency to the user, obviously, which is um, a requirement as per, for the, as per the GDPR, but also to the publishers. Um, I imagine as a publisher today, you might have a hard time to list every vendor that might have at some point access to your user's data. Uh, you might know the direct vendors you work with, but you most likely don't know all of the vendors that at some point had access to your user's data. Uh, because they were buying some art from your website through programmatic pipes, because they were working with a buyer uh, that was buying your inventory. Um, so this framework, because it will provide you with the global vendor list and from which you will be able to choose and pick only the list of vendors that you allow to use your, your user's data, you will have a much more control and much more transparency over those vendors. Uh, like I just mentioned, it, these frameworks also provide the aud auditable consent trail, uh, providing a way for companies to know rather than assume the consent studies they have from a user. And last but not least, uh, because these frameworks provide us a common language, a way to communicate between each other about users' consent, it's the first opportunity that we have as an industry to basically share consent information from a user among the different partners, among the different publishers and vendors, uh, which means that we can provide users with a much better experience. And like today, where we have to, every time a user goes on a website for the first time, ask him consent already for at least reading and setting cookie. We know other way to want to obtain this consent, share it across the different publishers, share it across the different vendors, allowing us not to have to ask consent again and again to the same user from one side to another. Okay, moving to next slide. Um, so this is uh, just uh, a list of the different endorsers, some of the endorsers that already support the frameworks or, or are in the process of supporting the frameworks. This is a website if you want to stay informed about any upcoming release uh, of the framework. So, so you mentioned that uh, most of the tech specs from the framework have already been released and available on the website. Um, so make sure that you join the website, that you um, register for it to, to make sure that you get any last update that uh, we and the IAB will provide. All right, thanks a lot, uh, Julian and Matthias, for presenting. So now we'll go into questions and answers. I see a lot of come in while we were talking already. Um, so I'm just going to jump right in with a question from Michael Neal, which asks, how will you deal with ITP? And I believe that means in, um, intelligent tracking protection uh, that you'll have on Safari. What if, for example, consensu.org gets put on a content blocking list? Okay, so um, I think ITP is a different, although related issue from GDPR. So the framework does not address the ITP directly, but it will obviously be impacted by it. For example, if you want to um, use a third party cookie as a way to store the consent and share the consent across different publishers, that might be blocked by um, browser like Safari that might be blocked by default third party cookies. Uh, so, we will have to address this, uh, most likely in a future release of the frameworks in a much uh, direct way, but already today, the frameworks allow 
uh, to have a fallback on a first party cookie in, in case um, we, you, you cannot use a third party cookies. So, uh, I think already one way we can address this today is a different way that we have to store the content, which can be third party cookies when possible, and when not, then fall back to a first party cookie. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, so, we have a lot of questions and about 30 minutes to get through them. So, it is possible that your question might not be answered. If that's the case, um, feel free to email us after. Uh, I think that's possible through GoToWebinar, and we'll try and get back to you uh, with an answer. Um, so I'm going to go to a question from Shahim Samadi, uh, who asks, won't the order of bits of every consent payload be different for each publisher? For example, bit 1 equals vendor 1 for publisher A, but bit 1 might equal another vendor for a different publisher. Okay, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, maybe the example that we were giving, uh, because we were simplifying, was not ex exactly explaining this, but basically, the global vendor list will avoid this issue. Like, the global vendor list will provide a unique ID for every vendor. That means that even though a publisher might decide to reduce this list to only um, 40 or 50 vendors that he work with, those vendors will remain and will keep the same unique ID as you can see here on the slide. Uh, and this ID is what gives the position of the bit, um, of the one or zero that gives consent for this vendor. Meaning that no matter which vendors the publisher decides to expose with, the ID and the position from each vendor will remain the same. So basically, they, the, the, the way to read the consent information will be the same no matter what the publisher decides uh, to expose as vendors. Uh, one just thing to add here is that basically in case as a, vend as a publisher you decide to expose only 40 vendors, like in the example that we, we provided, for the vendors that you expose, user will have a choice to give basically a consent, which results in one, or not give a consent, which results in zero. But for all the all the vendors that you decide not to work with, they basically automatically get a zero, and just user do not get a chance to give consent because you just not desire to. Uh, but the way to read it will be again the same across all of the different publishers and all the different vendors. Okay, thanks. I think that leads to a similar question from Fayez uh, Shivar Dankar, um, who asks, if a user has given global consent on publisher A, would that mean that when they go to publisher B, they do not need to be shown the consent framework UI? So, yes, exactly. Uh, obviously, when uh, consent will be asked for and will be shared among multiple publishers, this will have to be explained to the consumer uh, when asking consent, like providing him information about like his consent will be um, shared across either globally or across a list of publishers. But once as this has been provided, this information has been provided to the user, and once the user agreed to it and gave consent to a list of vendors, those information will be shared among the different publishers. Which means that next time user goes on another website that use the same consent information. This website distributor do not need to expose the user again to the UI. He can decide to if he wants to ask consent to some additional vendors that were not provided consent or that were not asked for consent in the first time, but he doesn't have to and he can just rely on the existing consent information that has been already given by the user. And I'll jump in here and say, because sometimes we get the question, well, is that allowed? Um, number one, the GPR does not have any language on how consent should be scoped. So it's uh, very important to just have the appropriate disclosures around that. And the Article 29 Working Party actually suggests a solution like that in order to minimize the amount of consent requests that a user is um, uh, presented with while uh, using the internet in one of their opinions. Okay, hang on, let me just find the next question here. Um, so, does the uh, CMP API allow for revocation of consent? It's a question that comes in from Mike O'Neill. Uh, 
So yes, but maybe, uh, yeah, sorry, maybe more generally, how does the framework deal with a revoc revocation of consent or withdrawal? So yes, the framework follows that. So basically, uh, the consent information uh, is given by the user and then is stored in a cookie. Uh, it is then passed in every ad call, in every bid request, it is passed as in its, in its current state. And this is what is used by the vendors. Uh, let's say that at some point, user decides to uh, revoke some of his consent or completely his consent. So Publisher will have to provide a way to the user to re-access the consent UI whenever they wish to. Uh, so that could be just a link uh, on their website or something under the option from a configuration from the website, uh, whatever the Publisher decides to. But then when the user is exposed again to the UI and decides to change its consent information, uh, whatever final consent information he ends up giving will basically erase the current state of the cookie, the current information within the cookie. And from there, any new ad call or any new bid request to any vendors, we basically use the latest information provided by the user and stored in the cookie. And thus is a new information that vendors will start using uh, from now on until user again change this consent information. Yeah, and from my side, just to stress that although we're talking about cookies, that is not the only way that these choices can be stored. So in your heads, replace cookie with whatever storage mechanism uh, you can think of. OK, thanks. Um, I see quite a few questions coming uh, in about the global vendor list. Um, so just as a sample question, I'll take this one from Yoko Nakagawa. Do you have to be a member of IB Europe to be included in the global vendor list? Uh, so that's a good question, and the answer is no. You do not have to be a member of IAB Europe to be included in the global vendor list. And um, I, I've seen that there is a bunch of questions around what type of vetting there will be happening. And um, uh, we, we, we are envisioning a requirement that vendors will need to be a member of some uh, organization that exists and um, you know organizes industry in one way or another because that is a a, a, a low effort way for us to um, uh, assume that there is uh, some legitimacy to uh, a company signing up. So IAB Europe would be one of many uh, uh, trade associations that would enable a vendor to become part of it but it doesn't have to be IAB Europe and uh, we are very flexible about that so we are, we are, we are um, going to take a look at um, uh, you know criteria and that's just one of them all right uh, this is a question that comes in which is uh, sort of related to some other work that IB Europe is also looking at uh, comes in from Joao Philippe Kaiser Machiel uh, will publishers always be controllers regarding their users' personal data? Regarding the tracking of user data for the tracking of advertising campaigns, will an advertiser or an ad network be joint controllers with the publisher? So um, first off, IB Europe is, has a working group that is trying to uh, define some common characteristics in the ad tech space, uh, which would put you in the, in the scope of being a, pro a processor or controller. Um, but for the purposes of the framework, maybe, um, Matthias, you can clarify yeah, a bit how we look at it. The framework is not concerned with whether or not a uh, entity is a controller or not. We are providing the pipes for communication. The legal assessments of one's controllership or processorship or joint controllership is something that has to happen on an individual company by company basis. And that will depend on many, uh, on, on many issues and um, that's, will be very uh, sort of unique to each interaction and it's probably not a simple um, yes or no answer in any case. Okay, another um, policy question. Can you comment on how the framework distinguishes e-privacy consent for a cookie, which is always needed, versus GDPR consent, which might not be needed? This question comes in from Nathan Salter. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So the framework enables you to make disclosures primarily, and then where needed to obtain consent. And uh, we recognize that the 
e-privacy directive may require consent in some cases and not in others. And uh, there, you don't always need consent to process personal data. So the way the framework could handle this is that you obtain consent and transmit consent for the purposes of e-privacy. And then you could potentially process data on another legal ground under GDPR. So that is something that the framework uh, does support. So would it, it would be possible, for example, to just obtain consent for the purposes of your privacy and then justify the processing of personal data collected afterward through a different legal ground for processing or to obtain consent throughout through the board. That is um, all, all supported. Okay, we have time for, I think, one or two more questions. So this is a question that came in from Chan Husmeli, um, who asks, the downstream or upstream will not happen in real time. Is there a standard procedure to overcome any conflicts? Uh, I'm not, sorry, I'm not sure I understood the question. Z or so downstream I think, or upstream? Yeah, so uh, the downstream slash upstream will not happen in real time. Uh, is the question like I guess the question is if it doesn't happen in real time is there a standard procedure to overcome any conflict any conflicting information there is a number of policies we have thought about that can minimize uh, or reduce or even get rid of uh, conflicts by just defining what takes precedence over uh, one or um, another signal um, so first service specific choices prevail over global choices. So that's a potential conflict where there is two different storage methods of two differently scoped uh, choices. Service specific prevails, conflict avoided. Um, where a vendor receives a signal and um, there were several si signals in, in, at, in near the same time, um, they will they will always receive them on an impression by impression level, so that's as fast as this information can be uh, transmitted. Um, the latest would be the most relevant, right? So a later timestamp prevails over an earlier timestamp, but that should really be edge cases because it's impression by impression, and we do have the resolution of the conflict at uh, at before the transmission happens and um so 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 we we have policies in place to mitigate this and julia i'm not sure whether there is some technical aspects to it um, that are relevant here as well okay so um we've reached the top of the hour now um and i think we've answered most questions or at least uh, answered in the direction of those topics. Uh, the last question that I'll read aloud is from Reshma Krishna who asks, can you please share your contact information for future questions we might have? So as I mentioned in the beginning, um, but some of you may not have joined yet, we will send a recording of this webinar as well as the slides in the email um, next week to you. Uh, you can reply to our uh, contact at IB Europe email to ask any more questions, but most importantly, you can visit our website advertisingconsent.eu, where there are several email addresses and feedback channels uh, through which you can get in touch with us or with the IAB Tech Lab for more uh, technical uh, nature questions. And that's how you can get uh, more information. Uh, you can get more information there. You can ask more questions through there. And you can also share your feedback if you think there's something we missed or there's something that you feel needs to be thought of. Um, and with that, I would like to thank you all for joining. And thank you to Matthias and Julian for presenting today and answering the questions. Um, we will be in touch with you with the follow-up email next week. And thanks for joining again. Have a nice afternoon or evening. <laughs>